Welcome to the second installment of the fall 2017 UC Santa Barbara Innovator Story Series. I'm John Greathouse. You can follow me on Twitter, at John Greathouse. We have with us tonight Kelly Ferguson. Kelly is currently the director of the Santa Barbara and Ventura County's Energize California program, and that's actually a subset of a larger program, um, which is, which is a, or a larger initiative, which is called the Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator. Kelly's, what she's really doing is she's trying to accelerate clean tech um, energy development by supporting entrepreneurs and startups and help giving them the resources to get their ideas off the ground. So these are smaller companies, um, in some cases idea stage entities that won't be able to go out in the private sector at this point and raise money because they're just not far, along, far enough along either improving out their idea or even just making sure their idea is feasible. Uh, incubators like this serve a invaluable, uh, as an invaluable resource because it helps companies through what's called the valley of death. The valley of death is that, that time between the idea and maybe the prototype to when you're really an, a viable company that can raise institutional money. So very, very important mission. Prior to joining the incubator, Kelly worked with the San Inez band of the Shumash Indians, uh, and she was their environmental director. And in that role, she was engaged with a diverse group of stakeholders. You can imagine a lot of people have different agendas um, sitting around the table, a lot of different jurisdictions that had, you know, they had different um, agendas as well, things that were important to them might not have been important to other folks. And her role was to enhance the tribe's capacity to protect their natural resources. And she also got involved in empowering the community with regards to a green jobs program. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, that was a great opportunity for her to combine her, her love of the environment and her um, compassion to see the environmental resources being used wisely with helping um, a group of folks that probably don't get that kind of expertise um, as often as they should, as often as they need it. So uh, we're not, as if that wasn't enough, that she's working um, with the Shumash, she also was elected as an advocate for 30 federally recognized tribes that comprise Southern California. So she represented 30 different tribes, and she worked with the EPA, and in that role she was working to strengthen the tribal, environmental, and public health programs, um, as well as addressing regional resource needs. So again, sitting there with the government, trying to work with 30 different tribes that might have, again, different resources that they're interested in conserving and different resources they want to exploit, um, just really takes a high emotional intelligence to pull that kind of thing off and make sure that you're moving forward and it's not just gridlock between all the parties. So before those two roles, Kelly spent several years at a software company and she was developing new products there. She worked in marketing. She worked on things like search engine optimization. She worked with new teams that were forming within that organization. We'll talk to her about that. And then right out of school, she had the guts to go start a company. So in 2007, she moved to New York City and she um, started a green modular housing company. And in that role, she learned a ton of things and she got to work with some award-winning green um, architectural designers. She's a native Santa Barbarian. She made it back home, which is awesome. So I hope my kids do go away, but come back. She received her master's degree in environmental science and management from UCSB's Bryn School. And she also earned her GPMP uh, certificate at the technology management program. Um, so full disclosure, uh, Kelly was a repeat offender. I think she took at least three of my classes, maybe more. And she was really with this wonderful group of graduate students that were very enterprising, very curious, very motivated, just really dialed into what they wanted to get out of their education. And obviously, 10 years later, um, you know, she stood out in my memory all that time, and we've stayed in touch. And now she's here to tell us uh, her story. Um, it's interesting that she was part of the New Venture Competition, and I've talked about that, the UCSB's New Venture Competition, for those of you watching this online or listening to it. Um, the videos are available online. Some amazing companies have come out of that competition. Some have gone public and had very, uh, very nice exits. Um, Kelly is the only person in her group that pursued that idea. They won the business plan um, aspect of the competition, and then they actually went off and later that summer and went around the country and did other competitions where they all business plan competitions that they won as well. So they're just very gifted, very talented students. She had her bachelor's degree in environmental policy from Vanderbilt University. And like most of the people I'm trying to bring up here, she's still giving back to the community, even, even now in her role at San, in, back in Santa Barbara. She's an alumni of the Leadership Santa Barbara County Organization, um, and she's active on the steering, she's an active steering commemor, committee member um, in which, in that role, she's building civic leadership inside of Santa Barbara. So it's clearly a person who's not content to sit back 
clearly a person that's giving back to her community. Um, and I just think that's a message that I can't reinforce enough. It's one thing to go out there and, and build an empire and, and make a bunch of money, but it's, uh, I think along the way, you should make sure that your community, um, just as Bruce Haven was saying last week, make sure your community also wins and succeeds when you succeed. Let's welcome Kelly to our class. Good to see you. So personally rewarding for me to have you come back because we've stayed in touch and yeah. I've followed your career and it's just really been fun to, to, see, um, to see you progress. Yeah. So I appreciate you doing this. Thanks for having me. Um, so let's start college years. Um, one thing, I, that was a really long introduction, but one thing I didn't say in that introduction, if there's anything I left out, um, you were an All-American tennis player and you were a pro tennis player. So. Listen, I'm, I'm never much of an athlete, and I certainly never played D1 sports, but I do know that it's incredibly demanding. So looking back now, would you, would you recommend that path for a student coming into school? So two-part question. And then when you look back on it all these years later, what were some of the things that really helped you in your professional career that you got from, maybe it wasn't evident at the time, but then you were able to leverage later? Sure, yeah. Um, well, it's, first of all, I wanna say it's really great to be here today, and it's a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was talking to someone earlier about it being, um, you know, one of the larger groups I've spoken to since the new venture competition. Really? So yeah, I've done a lot of presentations, but not for very large right. groups. So right. it's, it's really great to be here today and um, kind of reconnect back. So excellent. Um, uh, so in terms of you know uh, college and sports and um, participating along those lines, I'd say it's you know I would really recommend it. Uh, it was not easy. Right. Uh, my first year at Vanderbilt, I I really honestly struggled academically. I had um, some difficult times. High school was really easy for me, yeah. um, and then went into a new environment where uh, school was really challenging. It was very tough to get an A at Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. um, and I was attempting to do pre-med for some reason. <laughs> so uh, I, you know, um, it, I was taking some really challenging classes and then the demands of the sport to, you know, you, you're in season for, you know, not the whole year, but you're always training. Right. And so the demands of that too were very, very hard. So, um, so it was a tough first year. Um, and, and on top of that, going to Vanderbilt, where I was born and raised in Santa Barbara, and then going to Nashville, Tennessee, which mm -hmm. is in the southeast, there was this big cultural shift as well. Yep. So it was like kind of this combination of things where I really felt kind of um, not in the right place. Right. Uh, but uh, at the end of our first year, we had a really successful run. We got to the finals of the NCAA tournament, oh, which was awesome. the first time in school history for any sport. Wow. Uh, so it was like one of those. What, for any of, sport? For, for any sport, yeah, at Vanderbilt. Wow. So it was a really, really big deal. Yeah. And um, myself and the other freshmen that year were the, were the two people who kind of won the, the final point. For, um, for Vanderbilt to get into the finals that year. So it was one of these things where I was questioning a lot of stuff and then that happened and I was like, it's all, <laughs> it's all good. I, I, I think I'm gonna stick around. Yep. Um, and I'm glad I did because uh, I really ended up loving my experience there uh, academically and with the, with the, the sport, sporting aspect of it. And uh, in terms of things that I've taken away from that, um, honestly, like, at the time, I was cognizant of this, and, and it's been one of the things that stuck with me, me the most is like the, the value of a strong team. And uh, you know, when you're in an environment where you've got like seven other teammates, two coaches, and you're competing at like very high levels week in, week out, you, know, you can really tell what difference it makes when you, you could have the best team of athletes in the world, but right. if the, demand, the dynamic's not there, it doesn't it doesn't work and we've had we had some really excellent teams some year and we didn't get as far as we thought we would and then other teams we may not have like the best uh athletes but yeah. somehow because right. of the camaraderie and the way we work together on and off the court right. like we did really really well that's well, true in business right yes i mean exactly. i've seen it you know sometimes being a little bit of an underdog and maybe having one or two people on your team mm -hmm. usually me that aren't as good kind of brings everyone else's game up because they know they have to compensate and, and deliver. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think that is an important lesson. And you are, that's an interesting team dynamic because it's not like a basketball team where it's five people on the court or a baseball team, nine mm -hmm. people. It's, it's almost like track in the sense that there's a huge individual component, but there is a team component, right? So it's yeah. even, I guess, doubles, you have one other person. Mm -hmm. But if you're playing singles, it's 
it's like golf. It's like you, yeah. but you don't want to let your team down. Yeah, and, and right. So growing up, I played all by myself all the time, right? And, um, and I did well. I did well enough to get into Vanderbilt and um, you know, play for a really highly regarded school. Uh, but it wasn't until I was like really in a team environment that I, I felt like I really excelled because mm -hmm. there was kind of that added, I don't know, pressure. But like, you know, um, I, I felt like I performed much better in that type of environment. Uh, so uh, that that was very telling to me uh, how much that uh, kind of rose my like my level and, yep. and and I played so much better and like would p compete so much harder in those situations. Yeah, so, yeah, and I and I don't know that that's the case for everyone who is attracted to tennis, right? It's yeah. like swimming. It's a very individual sport. Um, again, doubles aside, but mm -hmm. it's basically an individual sport, and then to throw that team element in there. Um, well, good for you. So it sounds like it really did help you in your yes. professional career. I had Kobe Fuller in here, Harvard you know, track star, and he had such great memories of, of that pushing your body, like pushing the discipline that's required to compete at that level is a great skill to, or, or characteristic to embody because you're going to use it every day, for basically. Sure. So you, I mentioned that you were here at UCSB. You came here in 2006, and you studied eco-entrepreneurism. You and you took a number of these entrepreneurial classes, um, and I mentioned you won the business plan competition, and then you went off and won the William James Foundation. Did you win another one besides that? I thought you won like three or something. Was it just? No, I think two? it was just those two. Okay, so then your rest of your team kind of looks at you and says, "I'm not going to do this." What was that moment like? And then what caused you to say, "Well, I'm going to do it"? Yeah. Um, so. I was very fortunate when I was at Bren and doing TMP that uh, we had this really awesome team and it was definitely not a, a curated team. It was one of those things where the, the year that uh, we did uh, the Ego Entrepreneurship Green Pieces was our, our company, mm -hmm. um, it was the first year that Bren offered this and it was a situation where they kind of uh, sprung this new uh, specialization on us two days before we had to decide, which is, which is actually, strangely enough, very similar to my undergrad experience. But um, uh, And so... Only, I didn't know that, by the way. I was teaching some yeah, of the classes. Yeah, so, so there were just four of us who were like, okay, yeah, we'll do this. And so I think that kind of willingness to like, take risks like, made us a really good team, and we also had very complementary skills. So right. we had, like still to this day, these people are some of my best friends. And so... Um, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to have those, you know. Um, but did other... you know that they weren't going to, was it clear that they were going to do different things? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think there's always this, like, we had talked about it, and, um, you know, they were applying for jobs, and so right. I, I kind of knew it was going to be my thing. Yep. Um, and, it, you know, in, inside of me, I was kind of like, oh, should I, should I apply for jobs, or, or should I just go for this? And I just yep. said, you know, I'm going to go for it, because w w let's just see what happens, and, yes. um, and, I believed in what we were doing, and obviously we were getting this, um, you know, this uh, these these words and um, affirmations. So, you know, I, uh, I felt like this was something that we could really move forward with, and I believed in what it was doing. It was a green modular housing company, so essentially, um, the idea was, you know, green housing for more people because it would be at a price point where more people could afford it. And this was kind of pre tiny home movement. Right? Yeah, um, and, and it's really funny because um, in our incubator now we actually have another green module housing. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah. So, um, but uh, yeah, there was a lot of this movement going yeah. around at that time for like green modular housing and, and how to incorporate this. And this was right before the, the mortgage crisis. Meltdown, right. So um, there was there was some good and there was like Dwell was you know really big and so these all had kind of a modern aesthetic to the to the look and. Um, you know, it just it, it felt like it was the right thing to do, and, and so I moved to New York and started working with the, the our architectural designer partners. And yeah, well, I want to talk about that, but I always admired that you did it because I knew the other obviously I knew the other teammates who were all really strong individuals and just good people. But the fact that they didn't do it, it would have been really easy for you to sort of not do it too. Mm -hmm. So you just said, "That's cool. I'm going to go for it." So now you go to New York. You're right out of school, right out of graduate school. How did that experience go? How long was the run? Like you get there, was it chaos and craziness? Was it fun? Um, yeah. Uh, so there was the moving to New York City part, which was uh, one of the biggest challenges. Uh, and another like kind of cultural fit right. challenge for me. Um, it was very, uh, there was a lot of, w when we got out there, uh, one of the big uh, objectives was to basically, we've been, we've been talking about this green modular housing 
project in theory. And so at that point, it was really about, OK, let's uh, design a prototype. Let's see how much this thing will cost. Let's see what the green elements are going to be in it. Mm -hmm. Let's start talking to modular housing factories. So a lot of that was, um, was my job to go throughout the Northeast and talk to these modular housing factories, see like could, because our decision at that point was, are we going to make our own factory to build these things, right. or are we going to partner with pre-existing factory and license out designs, things like that. So, yep. um, so that was a, a whole new world where I really didn't know much about. And so it was a, a lot of learning from there. And then same thing with the prototype development. I'm not a designer. Of, I'm not an architect. So uh, there was a big learning curve there, too. But fortunately, I was working with a lot of people who were, that's what they did for a living. So that was. Um, um, very, obviously very helpful. Uh, and then, you know, ultimately did, I did that for a, a little less than a year. Um, and then that was kind of around the time of the mortgage crisis. Right. Um, but, you know, it wasn't so, that wasn't really the reason that I stopped doing that. Um, I think it was kind of clear to me that it wasn't really the place for me. Uh, just the dynamic and the and the communication in the organization was not quite where I wanted it to be, and again, like culturally, like uh, the Northeast in New York City wasn't right. really a fit. I mean, I'm a California person, right, so right. Um, I really kind of aspired to be somewhere where things were a little more chill and um, right. a place where I felt at at home and at ease, and um, and you know it it was a challenging decision to come back, but I really felt like it was the right thing for me to do and like the healthy thing for me to do. Right. Um, because I could have, it, it just, I could tell the kind of the direction it was going. It was not where I needed to be anymore. Um, and I remember kind of periodically talking to you and being like, am, am, I, am I crazy <laughs> or is this like, is this okay? Is this not okay? And, and so it was good to like be able to, to talk to you about that kind of thing. Well, I and, think, and I, but I think it's hard to, uh, you have to be honest with yourself, mm -hmm. and you, you obviously don't want to be a quitter, don't want right. to throw in the towel too soon. Totally. But at the same time, if you're, I mean, we all know really what our gut's telling yeah. us. Sometimes we don't really want to hear it, and, or we rationalize it away. Um, but you definitely gave it a shot. I mean, you were there, you gave it a shot, you, 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 you had that experience. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are never bold enough to go, um, to go for it and do that. So you know what it felt to sort of not have a net and just free fall and just hope for the best. So then you come back to Santa Barbara, and you ended up um, working for a lar not a large company, but large for Santa Barbara, very successful company um, that is kind of dominates their space. So, so, so a good place in that regard. Um, and you were a bit of an entrepreneur inside this larger organization. So you go from like, you know, full on, just like I'm trying to figure this out. Are we going to build these? Are we going to buy these? Whatever. And now you're in an organization with structure. How was that transition? And you know what? How frustrating or how enjoyable was that? And what, uh, how did that help you as you kept going in your career? Uh, so, you know, at the time, uh, so I left New York. I came back to Santa Barbara. And I wanted to be in Santa Barbara. My family is here. Um, my boyfriend and my husband were here. And I wanted to be here. And that's right. where all my connections are. And um, yep. I'm obviously very committed to, to Santa Barbara as a community. Uh, and so I was looking around, applying for lots of jobs. wasn't getting any jobs. Uh, it was and, a tough time, too. <laughs> yeah, it I was mean, the a economy tough time. was not in great yeah. shape. Um, and so I had some personal connections at, uh, we're not saying. You could say Okay, it. so I, I worked for Yardy Systems. And so I had some personal connections at Yardy Systems. And um, at the time, uh, they had a marketing position open. And so I applied for that, uh, that position. And um, I, uh, I got the job. And then a week into the job, <laughs> They moved me to a completely different role, <laughs> which was uh, um, which was working on uh, kind of the foundational research and competitive analysis for an internet listing site, which is you know kind of like your apartments.com. Right. Um, and so this eventually became some foundational research, which ended up being uh, one of the their biggest product platforms that they now have. Um, and so that was one of the very first things that I worked on. And they saw that w the experience I got through the TMP program, that this was a good fit and something, you know, um, probably better fit than the marketing aspect of the, mm -hmm. the work there. So I did that and then eventually started up a group in um, Yardy that did photography services for our clients. So um, <coughs> hired the team that did that, uh, you know, organized all the logistics for that type of team. They were all over the country, um, all the collateral that came in and then, and then trans transitioning that into the actual website. Mm -hmm. So kind of hit all those elements and all that stuff was brand new. So 
um, it was really fun doing this. Uh, and I was given a lot of latitude. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I just like came well, in. You performed. And yeah, yeah. And so it, it was great. Um, uh, it, I think it's an unusual experience to go into a company and, and then they just go, yeah, no, I'm going to do your thing. Um, so, so that was great. And then I transitioned to a, a several different roles there involving marketing and SEO and um, yeah, a, a bunch of and different things. How long things. were you there? I was there for four years. Four years. Yeah, wow. yeah. Um, okay. And and at that time, you know, like, I continued to want to be involved in the environment, and um, there I wasn't getting that there. Right. Um, and and kind of the internal startup thing was kind of scratching a certain itch for a while, but I, ultimately, like, I really wanted to be doing something positive for um, environmental causes, and uh, so. You know, I, I was keeping my eye open for for opportunities where yeah. I could where I could make an impact in that way. Well, four years is a good run, and mm -hmm. I think there's there's a, a lot of good lessons there. Um, you don't have to start a company, or you don't have to join a startup of ten people to be an entrepreneur or to have an entrepreneurial job. And so, I think a lot of companies, not every company, you have to make sure the culture is right. But at a lot of companies, they're going to welcome that sort of entrepreneurial spirit. Somebody who wants to sort of, you, you were charting out the future of their company with regards to that listing service. So someone who says, hey, I want to I wanna be an entrepreneur inside this business and let's talk, I don't really want to look at today's business, I want to think about 10 years from now. If you can show that proclivity and show a little bit of talent in that regard, you can put yourself in that role. And you obviously did well and then they put you in front of the, the opportunity for the photos and if you stayed, I'm sure you would have kept doing stuff like that. So don't discount your ability to make an impact inside a large organization. Just be careful that you're picking one with the culture that allows young people to make an impact. Because mm -hmm. they don't, not all of them do. Okay, so you're, you're feeling like you know, you were, it was fun for a while and you were making an impact, no doubt, but you, weren't going, you hadn't gone back to your roots. Um, and even an undergraduate, your degree was environmental studies essentially, right? Mm -hmm. Environmental policy. Environmental policy, so you, go, you wanted to get back to your eco roots you ended up with the Shumash and you were helping them as the environmental manager. Um, what, I can imagine that could have been a very fulfilling opportunity, could have been a little challenging opportunity. Um, I'm, I, you could tell me a little, talk to us a little bit about that, but I'm also curious, what was the difference between the classroom setting at Bryn when you're talking in theory about environmental policy or even an undergrad at Vanderbilt, and then you're actually sitting there with people who have a stake in this environmental policy that you're talking about? What, how was that different, or yeah. was it? Did you feel like there really wasn't incongruence? Um, well, I'll, I'll answer the second <coughs> part first. Uh, so, um, you know, I, th I think Bren does a really good job of taking a realistic approach to what it's like to take, I guess, you know, you're in school, but it's taking a very realistic approach to what it's like in the real world. Mm, um, that's what they're trying to do there is create, you know, uh, professionals out of out of Bren that um, can uh, do whatever you know whether it's field work or in um, corporate environmental management or in in, in the eco entrepreneurship program. So uh, I think it is very focused on creating practical problem solvers mm -hmm. um, and being able to work in those situations. So um, you know there's definitely it, it it wasn't that challenging of a transition mm -hmm. um it was you know it, it was funny because the the switch from yardy to the chimash was about as 180 as i could get right um and the funny thing about it is i came to the organization and i said okay i'm going uh, we should we're going to do all this interesting like email marketing and we're going to you know this that and the other and then it was like well you know what we do here is we just go door to door <laughs> and i was like oh Okay, so like this like initial thought of right. of the work I was going to be doing kind of like really really switched up, and um, at the time I was very concerned because I'd been four years in an organization that was not environmentally focused, mm. and, and concerned about how relevant I was mm -hmm. to that sector anymore. But mm -hmm. it turned out a lot of what I learned um, when I was at Yardy like was kind of un unique and, and uh, attracted um, them to to hiring me. So. Um, I was very like grateful for those ex um, experiences there. And then, what was the first part of the question? I already <laughs> lost it. <laughs> I asked you such a long question; it was, it was kind of ridiculous. I was just, I was just curious as to, um, you know, how challenging was it? Was it? Did you find it bureaucratic? Did you find it? 
Um, yeah, uh, at times, yes, of course. Uh, and then other times, I think it, it worked remarkably efficiently. Uh, mm -hmm. So sa same thing, you know, at, at, uh, at Chumash, I was given a lot of latitude. So I started out as their environmental manager and then about a year in um, became the director of the department. And so, you know, we went out and got our own grants to run our department. Right. We created our own programming. Um, we developed a really strong team. So um, in, internally within our department, we had a, um, you know, a really great functioning um, a group of individuals. We had an uh, uh, environmental committee, which consisted of people from the community who would give us feedback and input. So you know, all in all, like, it, worked, you know, it worked really, really well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, n not every job is perfect, and there were definitely times where you know, we'd get stuck and, yep. and you know, work really hard towards a goal, and then it would like peter out and so th those things can be you know frustrating obviously sure. but um i think too taking like what i really learned there was like being very strategic so i could have something in my mind about something i wanted to accomplish uh, as an ultimate goal for where i wanted this where i wanted our department to go um but it wasn't necessarily the time for me to go and be like hey i want money for this this and this right like you know, it was, okay, wait for the opportunity, mm -hmm. you know, like seed some conversations here and there, and then, you know, wait for the door to open or wait for someone else to come up with the idea and mm -hmm. then be like, oh yeah, that's a great idea I've been thinking about, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just trying to find, find ways to be sophisticated about how you make your asks and make your, um, your points about like where you, where you want to go. So, yeah, that was, that was, probably the, the, the one of the key things that I learned while I was there. And I think that comes with, I mean, I didn't have it at your age. It comes with maturity, you get that wisdom, I think over time, I don't think very many people in their early 20s have that kind of wisdom. And you weren't much past your early 20s at that point, so, so good for you. I was always just like, I just blurted out, <laughs> bad timing, <laughs> so what? So I've been asked, I've been so excited about asking questions, I haven't given the students a chance, but we'll, we'll take this uh, first student question. Do you believe that the current pol political climate has affected the energy industry and the demand for yeah. green technology, and if so, how? Yeah, so um, obviously there's a lot going on at the federal level right now in terms of what direction we're going with uh, the environment and energy. Um, so I think, you know, one of the big advantages for um, one of the things that helps clean tech companies is grant funding. Um, and so that comes from a variety of sources, including the federal government. Um, so obviously, uh, things that affect the federal budget, um, you know, for DOE or for EPA, things like that, will obviously uh, impact opportunities for these types of companies moving forward. So I think that's a worry. Um, but at the state level, I think we're seeing a very renewed commitment to moving these things forward. And my current position is funded by the California Energy Commission as part of this acknowledgement that uh, we have these uh, regulatory goals we're trying to meet. We're trying to hit these climate targets, these energy targets. So, uh, and, and we're not quite there yet. And so how do we um, fund the ecosystems, fund the entrepreneurs so that um, we can get these technologies to market faster? So I think we're seeing uh, a, a lot at the state level. And so there's some, some continued opportunities there. You mentioned um, the grant earlier. To, you ended up securing a million dollar grant. Um, what, what was the specific purpose of that grant, and was it tied in with the work you were doing with the EPA, or was that totally separate? Um, so, all in all, the, so the million dollars was like over several grants. Um, so this was at Chumash, yeah. um, and uh, so we pretty much funded our department almost entirely through grants. Okay. Um, so, you know, we would get grants from the EPA, from... Uh, DOE from Administration for Native Americans. Um, so uh, there were a lot of sources, and I got very good <laughs> at writing grants. Right. Um, that's a very important job, yeah. and it's yeah. not the most fun job, right. but it's an extremely valuable job. Um, and so uh, th that was, you know, a lot, all that money kind of went to the programs that we ran at, uh, at the Chumash Environmental Office. And then with the Regional Tribal Operations Committee, that was kind of tied to an EPA grant function. And so through that, myself and two others were um, the reps for the, the Southern California Fred, Federally Recognized Tribes. Mm -hmm. um, and so that effort was really to uh, 
allow to, to provide this open line of communication between tribes and the EPA so that they could function more effectively, be totally acknowledging the fact that you know, oftentimes these government organizations don't work well one-on-one right, -on -one right, and, right. and tribes in the past and, and presently have been um, neglected in a lot of ways and not listened to and they have uh, unique problems and, uh, you know, uh, very serious challenges in many respects. And so, you know, how can the EPA work better with tribes so that they can be an asset and a help and do their, you know, their, do their job to, right. to provide the resources needed for um, these communities? So. Did you feel like you were able to move the ball with the EPA? You were able to um, make some progress? You know, in, in, uh, there was one in particular, um, speaking about the, the, the RTOC, the Regional Tribal Operations Committee, there's a, um, uh, like a, a really devastating situation going on at the Salton Sea. Uh, I don't know how many people are aware of it, but um, uh, essentially the Salton Sea is this very large, not necessarily in terms of water, but in terms of land mass, uh, sea right like near the border of Mexico. And... Um, it was kind of this accidental lake, and right. uh, because of some agreements between um, some water agencies in San Diego, they uh, decided to divert the water that was going into the Salton Sea to San Diego uh, as just part of water negotiations. But the impact on that area means that lake's going to dry up, and there's going to be all sorts of uh, impacts, particularly in terms of air quality as the, mm. the lake dries up. and. Um, you have all these air quality issues with the wind picking up all of the um, the sand, and the, and the whole region around there is full of agriculture. So there's all this like um, drainage that goes in there that has you know some things that you don't want to be breathing in the air, and that area already has terrible air quality. So there's a tri there's several tribes in the Coachella Valley that would be uh, really affected by that. So one of the things I helped work on was um, it's a really Talk about a jurisdictional right, like right. mess. So you have like multiple air agencies, multiple water agencies, like the state, the federal government, like you know different counties, uh, tribal governments, like lots of. So how do you make that work? With it seems like the tendency there is everyone just pointing at someone else. I mean that's and... yeah yeah. Um, so that's you know uh, I don't know the current status of it, but it's it's. Uh, super challenging about like, okay, well, we need money to do these things. Okay, now how do we allot this money and what projects are we gonna move forward with? There's not enough money, like how do we prioritize this? So there's so many challenges there, but one of the, the things that I was helping to work on was um, the tribes really felt like they were not being included in, in discussions mm. with what was going on here and it was going to be impacting, you know, um, oftentimes when there are these, you know, public comment periods, there's no outreach to tribes because people I don't think people ignore tribes. I right. just think they don't know how to engage tribes. Right. Um, and so, you know, uh, there wasn't really any input or comments on when they were making this agreement that would impact this whole area. And so there was a lot of frustration on that on behalf of tribes. So ultimately, um, you know, that decision was done and made. And so now it's how do we deal with re repercussions. So it was really about bringing in um, uh, the EPA to these discussions and be like, okay, you need to help facilitate this discussion with, with what's going on with the tribes so that they can actually put their input in and, you know, get their say and, and make sure that their, you know, their concerns are being accounted for as well. So that was something I was so with. So you were their advocate at the EPA level. Did, and the, did the way it worked is you would meet with the tribes, understand their input, understand what, you know, the, what they wanted to see happen. Did, and then you went back to the EPA and tried to initiate that or was it more of you were just a conduit to get their voice heard at the APA um, kind of both so uh, I would so one of the reasons I wanted to be involved in this in the first place is I really enjoyed working for the Chimash but um, you know this the San Diego as Chimash are, are doing really well in a lot right. of respects right. and so um, I I wanted to connect with the, with other tribes to um, see what other issues were out there and see how I could help so um, the, the Chimash are like one of the northernmost Southern California tribes. Um, and oh, the way myself and the other kind of elected officials, like we separated it was, you know, we would take like 10 tribes a piece. And so mine was like the Coachella Valley was my, mm. my, my, my group of tribes. And so um, I would make a point to travel down there and meet with 
with them because I felt like that was the most effective way to get people in a room and also like guilt people in like I drove four hours right, to right, get here right. so you have to come see me yeah. um, and 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 it, I think it worked really well because I was also like new you know to the to the whole thing and mm -hmm. um, and just to kind of like work on that face to face which I think is so important um, I so, didn't realize you were elected so yeah yeah I mean it's a little yeah it, so it, it was um, it was a uh, an opportunity to just work with with new tribes and so I got to um, I would I would get down there and then um, basically just say like what are your major issues how do you think that the RTOC and the EBA can help um, and then take that back we would have quarterly meetings um, the RTOC and so we would present those issues the EPA would also be present mm. I mean they were they were you know very big meetings with multiple layers of the EPA. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, it was, I think, you know, I think it's a productive vehicle to, to keep that relationship in line open. Like, it's not perfect, but, right. um, you know. So uh, it sounded like they were committed to helping the EPA, but they just didn't really know what move, helping meant. Well, things move slowly, you know. Yes. Like, and, and sometimes it's like beyond one organization. Yeah, it's just, you know, you can only do so much sometimes. Like, well, I, when I read that about your background, I was like, that seems like to be the antithesis of an entrepreneur, to be able to have that patience, mm. that level of patience to deal with the Very bureaucracy. <laughs> now, I know you're patient. Um, and I think that's, you know, you, you've got quite a breath there because I would, it would be hard for me. I'd be extremely frustrated. Yeah, yeah. And very I can ineffectual. See that. <laughs> I can see that. I yeah. No, I mean, that was some, you know, really something that I, I uh, had to be flexible with at first and really kind of just learned to, okay, like things just take time. It's okay. Just like, because otherwise I'm like stressing myself out right. and I'm super unhappy right. and, and, probably, and everybody else is angry. And <laughs> right. And you're, you're less effective because yeah. you're not in the vibe that they're in. Yeah. Uh, we'll take the, the next student's question. And what was your biggest motive for wanting to bring new technology to markets, and how do those two things go hand in hand? Yeah, so one of the things I think that attracted me to eco-entrepreneurship at Brennan in the first place was, um, you know, people associate uh, environmentalism with, like, regulations and yeah. no right. and, um, and <laughs> barriers to things, uh, and that's not my personality. Uh, and so I think like this whole world of, of eco entrepreneurship and, um, and supporting these companies in this incubator, like that's, that's you know, this way of, of creating solutions to these problems that are productive right. and positive. And so that's very appealing to me. So, yeah. And I, I really saw that in the, I taught the Bren students for, I don't know, five years or so. Sort of it's like hippies realistic hippies like it's not the <laughs> idealistic hippie that never gets anything done um, and it's not the uber angry person that you know is going to alienate everyone it's really just someone that says listen uh, if the government can help us wonderful but we're not going to rely on the government helping us we're going to create something that's sustainable on its own mm -hmm. and I really like that about your your project and, and many of the projects that that have come through that program it's it's I think the smart way of going about it because if you're reliant on a government program, it can come and go with mm -hmm. different politicians. So you want to be able to weather those storms. Mm -hmm. so, so I definitely saw that in your group, and um, and I've seen it in a number of brand groups since then. So getting back to the incubator, I know most of the, or all the companies at this point are nonprofits, so they're not out. Or they are? Did I get that wrong? Sorry. Yeah. So they're they're double bottom line though, right? Yeah. Yeah. I so, mean, yeah. So so sorry, I confused that. Um, what, talk to me about the impact report and the way you guys are, are, are I know that your, your cohort is new, but the incubators yeah. had a number of companies. How are you measuring success? What are the metrics you're looking at? Yeah, so yeah, measuring success is always a big challenge, um, especially like it's a challenge too for um, a lot of clean tech companies because there's this long runway, right. lots of capital needed, lots of time. But um, uh, so yeah, so the companies in our incubator are all nonprofits, as far as I'm aware, um, and you know, uh, a lot of them have they obviously have a clean tech bent to them, um, and some of them have you know social missions to them as well. Uh, so w one of the things that um, uh, Los Angeles Clean Tech Incubator did this year was um, create this uh, impact report we call it Just Impact, uh, and and through that we are measuring metrics uh, in social, economic, and environmental 
to kind of showcase the work that we've been doing and, and its results in the, um, the companies that we've been working in and also as like a tool to work with investors mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and, and show like, you know, the impact that these companies are making. Um, so, uh, you know, that came out earlier this year and it's been really, really well received. Uh, so we, you know, on the kind of jobs and like economic and social, you know, components of what we do, like we've, you know, um, uh, there's been, you know, a massive increase in the number of employees that have come out of um, that are companies in our incubator. Mm -hmm. There have been, um, you know, a doubling of the number of female employees, almost a quadrupling of the number of um, minorities employed. Oh, so, like some of these, like, you know, r really cool um, impacts. And then, you know, we track things like greenhouse gas emissions, yeah. water reduction, mm -hmm. and those things are challenging for a startup, right? Like maybe they don't yet right. have those. So, right. you know, there was a lot of work done internally to work with the startups on like. You know how to measure this because like a lot of them are just like oh well you know I, I'm busy running a business right, <laughs> like I can't right. figure out like how much water you know this is safe so you know uh, there was a lot of time invested into it by certain members of our team so um, you know it's, I think it's something that they can really be proud of and, and something that we can also build on because sure. it, it's a brand new it's like the first time we've done a report like that so yep. um, hopefully we'll be doing those on a yearly basis and well, be able to really track that I think it's another resource that'd be good for students to look at. That, or oh, yeah. anyone that's thinking about doing a, a clean tech business environmentally, mm -hmm. or, um, because you, it, you might open your eyes to some metrics that they hadn't thought of yet, because they are so busy just running their yeah. business, trying yeah. to keep it alive and, yeah. um, and not go out of business. Um, I'll take the next student question in a second. Um, I just want to sort of dovetail what you're doing now in, in, in the four counties that you're focused on, the two in particular. Are there ways that students can get involved if a student is out there with an idea? I know actually we have a couple in the audience that want to talk to Kelly afterwards. But if there are students that have an idea, or maybe they don't have an idea, but they just feel, they, they feel like you were, that they're just sort of driven to this, mm -hmm. and it's a mission that they want to pursue. Mm -hmm. what, how can they get involved? What would you suggest? Yeah, so like on a, on an, you know, we have a strong internship program that we run. So um, that goes through, like, you know, if you're really interested in that, like, please feel free to, to reach out to me um, or go to the LACI website, um, which is laci.org. It's pretty straightforward. You can email me, too, and I'll make sure Kelly gets it. Um, and so, so there's that aspect. The other aspect of it is, like, we have a whole host of startups that have open positions. Mm. So, like, that's a whole nother avenue of... Right you know, em employment, um, LACI hires people on a regular basis. So, you know, that's, you know, so we're, I, you know, we're always looking for like bright minds to like right. get involved. So that's definitely one way if you have um, an idea for a startup or you have a startup, by all means, talk to me. Um, and I would also say like, you know, with what I'm doing in this area, we're going to be having events uh, periodically. So, you know, like plug, you know, uh, uh, Energize California, uh, go visit it at energize-ca.org because we're going to um, and sign up to get on the mailing list. We'll have events, um, opportunities to network with, you know, folks in the industry. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's one thing if you're really interested in getting into this sector. Um, on, on top of that, um, we're going to be, you know, recognizing that there's probably a limited number of uh, clean energy companies in, in these regions, right? So like, right. let's say I do the best job ever and everybody gets in the innovators program, like now what? Right, right. <laughs> so, you know, we definitely have an eye out for like what's next um, and why I'm really excited about what happens here at UCSB because I think there's opportunities to really kind of, you know, uh, put people with problems in front of bright minds and seed those next ideas. So. Um, you know, stay tuned for opportunities with that. We're looking at some engagement with uh, the County of Los Angeles to do kind of almost like a switch pitch thing. Mm -hmm. So um, organizations come to So people to say, launch. here's the problem I have. Yeah. What's the solution? Okay. Yeah. And so either, you know, maybe the solution already exists. So you've got entrepreneurs being like, oh, I've got, you know, I'm, right. I, I'm doing that. Right. Or you've got um, people in there being like, oh, that makes me think about this. Like maybe mm -hmm. this is a way. And, and so that's always the best way to come out an idea is <laughs> like a clear problem with a clear customer. Yeah, yeah. So um, we'll, be, we'll be looking to do things like that up here as well. So great. I would say stay tuned on that. Yeah, definitely get, um, get on the mailing list so you can get the emails and know where the events are. And if you have an interest at all in, in, in this world, this is the network you should be trying to introduce yourself to. Right? You should mm -hmm. just be going to events, getting to know people. And I can guarantee you that, especially if you're doing this as an undergraduate, it's going to impress people because just so few of the 
undergrads really take the time to do it. So that's a great way to stand out. And the worst thing that happens is you have something really in, unusual and interesting to talk about on your resume. So yeah. there's really no downside to it. Yeah, and stay tuned to like what's going on at LACI if you like are able to make it down for a really interesting event, because we have some really interesting events going on down there. Um, and you know, there's all, you never know who you're gonna talk to. Right. Like, yeah, uh, there's all sorts of industry people, nonprofit people, startups. So, you know, you might be sitting next to someone who's doing something really cool. And yep, you it just, could change your life. Yeah. Be careful, it could change your life. <laughs> we'll take the next student's question. Hello. Um, you talked uh, about struggling earlier in school. And do you see any carryover in those challenges today? And what do you think your biggest tool is in accomplishing these? Um, yeah, so uh, when I was in school and I was struggling, like my first year in college, uh, it was a very overwhelming experience. And so I really had to kind of step back and really focus. So obviously like college is really distracting, right? <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I struggled a lot the first year and, I, and I, I wasn't a partier at all, but I still had a really hard, hard time. I was, I was um, yeah, it was just very overwhelming to be in like that level and that caliber and it took me a while to get used to. And that seems to be something I kind of carry over. Um, I'm not necessarily somebody who like steps in a room and like dive, like joins a group, and I'm like, hey, you know, I'm much more of a, you know, like I, I kind of sit back and I um, observe and like figure out where the most efficient and best way for me to participate is. Um, and so that's something I think like after my first year of school, like really I had to um, assess and focus really hard on like how I, so I, like my second year, I just like spent all my weekends doing work so I could free myself up during the week to focus on tennis. So I, I really had no life, but it was, I was very successful. <laughs> um, so you like, you have to make a lot of sacrifices and, and kind of look the, the long view and, and, and in how that's kind of helped me now and how I tackle things now. Like I try not to jump into too much because it's very overwhelming and then you just do a bad job everywhere. Right. Um, and that's a constant struggle. Um, so I, I, I really kind of sit back at first, kind of see where I can be most effective and then try to target my efforts. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, I mean, as a younger person, I would overcommit, 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 train wreck. It's a constant balance. <laughs> Under, you know, and, they, and then it would happen again. It yeah, took me life. forever before I really tackled that. So you mentioned um, some of the some of the the diversity metrics you guys are measuring. I know that you um, the incubator created a diversity um, advisory council, mm -hmm. diversity and entrepreneurship mm -hmm. advisory council. I'd love to know like what 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 some of those actual um, what were some of the specifics around that to, to drive yeah. uh, that diversity. And then I have a question for you, just as um, in your work world now in the last ten years. Have you felt that you've had, to, has it been challenging for you as a woman? Have you had issues where you just were like, really? I mean, are we still dealing with this? Yeah. Um, yeah, so like the, the first part of that, um, so with our diversity and inclusion initiatives, like, you, you know, um, most of this industry is like all startups and, and are usually like white guys. And, um, and so, we find and, and the evidence supports that when you've got more diverse teams and um, more women on teams that you are more successful. Uh, and so we've been really trying to drive a lot of that data home uh, also to investors as well because um, you know uh, th there's all sorts of statistics out there that, sh that show that um, you know a very small portion of you know women owned businesses get money from investors but right. yet like those companies that do get the money are like a lot more successful. Um, and so you know, how do we um, really uh, inform parts of the ecosystem about the value of this? And, and also, you know, how do we include um, more uh, diverse entrepreneurs into this ecosystem? So how are you doing that? Because yeah. I, I think that's, that there's two-sided problem, right? You have the yeah. people that aren't making the investments, you know, for, for a variety of reasons, um, and hopefully they're getting educated. Mm -hmm. 
But you also have the entrepreneurs themselves. How do you get them? How do you attract them? And uh, I don't. I don't. There's no like silver bullet to it yet. But really, it's about expanding your network and including people who are not normally included. Right, so it's like right. a, a step-by-step process. Um, and so we, you know, we host. Um, we do quite a lot of uh, events around this to try to bring in um, entrepreneurs that wouldn't normally be part of, you know, uh, you know, something that we're we're putting on. So. Um, we have, you know, women in clean tech <laughs> events. We have uh, diversity events, uh, and then, um, and and really, it's, you know, people rely on their current network, and if their network looks like them, then it's never right. going to look different. So right. it's also about bringing, you know, starting with a few people, you know, bringing um, new faces, uh, d- diverse ideas, diverse opinions, and yeah, then right. you know, expand off of that network, and so then it starts looking different. Um, it's yeah it's a it's a it's a process and and you know we're we're trying internally too to um you know create standards for how we go about hiring people um you know making sure that we're taking that extra step not putting it out on like the regular channels but like really like you know what are new channels that we can approach in order to get the word out how do we um uh, create messaging so that it's clear that we're looking for these types of candidates so um, there's there's a lot that goes into it, but I think ultimately, like once that ball gets rolling, then it feeds itself, um, and then um, you get a stronger group of entrepreneurs, stronger group of companies. Uh, yep. So yeah, so it's 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 a real issue. And if you go back and read any book, and I've been guilty of this, I've been guilty of writing uh, some, this sentiment in the past. How do I get money from a venture capitalist? Well, the answer most venture capitalists would give you is, and it's because of efficiency, they would say, well, get a, ref- a reference. Find somebody that I know, that knows me, and that I trust, and have them refer you. And that's a very efficient way of doing it. But the end result is that, as you say, that, that really just limits people to people that are can get to, into my network. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. if you don't have access to my network already, you might get in. And there have been people, I've invested in people that you know grew up in a very non-traditional um, backgrounds, but it makes it more difficult for mm-hmm. people. And it may, be, it may be demoralizing to them if they have to say, well, how am I going to find somebody that John knows and trusts to get a reference from? I can't do that. Mm-hmm. So we need to work with that. And, and I've said if I ever do another venture fund, like we're not going to have that model. Like that model worked in the past. It was very efficient and we funded great companies. But we need to have a new model where it, the, the top of the funnel is totally open. Like somebody that Anybody that has a good idea should get their voice heard in some way. Mm-hmm. I just struggle with how do we do that in, in an efficient way that, that doesn't just become overwhelming where you're getting so much yeah. input you can't process yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, and uh, thinking back to like when I was working with, with GMASH, like through my experiences, I'd be exposed to like particular people that I was like, oh, they're, they're good, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, right. you know, keeping an eye on particular people and like, again, like being strategic and waiting for opportunities, like sometimes like, you know, just getting out there and then just kind of seeing what's out there and seeing like what catches your eye and then being like, all right, that, you know, maybe, the, you know, like kind of bring them on in. And, um, you know, I, I think that could be just like a way like individuals can, um, you know, bring more right. diversity into well, their, you know. And I think as you say, it, it becomes, a, it, it, hopefully the problem starts to solve itself a little bit yeah. as you have a more diverse group, because their network's going to be more diverse too, but yeah, it's got to yeah. start somewhere. But you know, like, you, so the other part of your question too was like, have I ever experienced that myself? Right. And right. you know, I don't have, I don't have any horror stories, thankfully. Good. Um, I've had, you know, a really like very positive work experience. Great. Uh, um, I would say, you know, like some of the things like that have affected me have been like much more, you know, on the on the passive side, uh, which is, you, you know, maybe not as like, uh, you know, devastating, but like is is a major problem because it is under the surface and it's just like the way of thinking and it's not challenged and so yep. that's kind of like the the obvious stuff is easy to be like, yeah, that's wrong, right. um, but the the kind of little things, you know, like yep. looking at a, at a group of um, entrepreneurs that come in and be like, yeah, you got no women on your team, what's up with that? Right, <laughs> like, right. Or, you know, oh, I see like on your on your financials that you pay the woman less than everyone, what's going on with that? You know, yep. <laughs> like, like asking those questions, um, you know, challenging people like, with, you know, how they're approaching a problem in the first place, like, yep. you know, they're, they're little things, but, you know, just, Speaking up and just you know making note of it yeah, is, is enough. A lot of times, I think, I think for people to think twice. And I agree. Change I their behavior. Drawing attention to it. I mean, I, I I'm lucky too that I haven't ever had to sit through anything like utterly egregious. But 
But I, I mean, there's been situations where uh, after a meeting, I've, I've talked to a couple men and I just, just sort of said, do you realize you, oh, you talked over so-and-so? Oh, yeah. Like a lot. <laughs> yeah. And I think you talked over her a lot more than you talked over anyone else. Yeah. Just be aware of that. Oh, yeah. Um, anyway. That happens. Yeah, I yeah. know. It's, <laughs> it's frustrating. But we'll end on a more positive note. <laughs> um, so it just, it's, it, it, I shake my head sometimes. But you've done a great job of staying in touch with me. Um, and I'm just wondering, are there any lessons that you could offer people watching, people in the audience, young people specifically that are just trying to build a network to begin with? What are some healthy, creative ways to, just to keep that network alive? Yeah, um, well, I, th I think um, getting yourself out there, like you were talking about this earlier, like before I came up here, uh, you know, really getting yourself out there networking before you need the help. Right. Even if like you might need the help right then, but like right. maybe not making the ask at that time and just kind of building towards it. It's that like strategic and and, and patience that's kind of needed sometimes. Um, like with you is pretty easy. I mean, you were really helpful as a as a professor and a teacher and um, and were open when I, you know, needed help and um, and it was it was really awesome to be able to be like, hey, I'm back in this again, and like reconnect with you. So that that's right. that was really easy. And and you know, I think also like when I would see you out, like I would say hi, I would make a point to say yeah, hi, right? Yeah. So like there are just these little things where you know you have all these touch points over a period of time, and it's not like um, you know super out of the blue, you know, yeah. and not having that connection over time. I think too, like most people are really willing to help. I think they are. Yeah, I mean, I I found that like you know, if you come at people in a positive and good way and, you know, you're not, you know, like super needy, but like yeah, you're like, yeah. you know, like honestly looking for some help. And uh, I think people are usually more than willing to, to step up and say, yeah, no, I'll spend a couple of minutes with you talking about something because people always want to share their experience and make it a little easier for the next person. So yep. um, I, I, I really think like, yeah, just getting yourself out there, not, not being, it's a, it's, Networking is like kind of uncomfortable and challenging, yeah. and uh, yeah. for most people, I think it. Even for me, yeah. But no, I remember no. a few things you did well. You don't want to, you don't want to brag on yourself, oh. but so I think you were always good about um, reaching out, not necessarily just when you needed something, but just to stay in touch. I thought that was wonderful. I have a lot of students that do that, but I really appreciated that with you. You were always very conscientious about saying thank you, which again, surprisingly, isn't always the case. And you would give me feedback on. Like if I gave you an introduction of what happened. So all too often somebody says, oh, can you introduce me to so-and-so? And then you never hear, like, well, did, it, did they meet? Did they not meet? Did it work? So I think people that are willing to help, it also makes it easier for them to help if you give them that feedback, mm -hmm. make it clear to them you know, that you appreciated it and that it worked, or mm -hmm. even that, hey, I never got in touch with that person, mm -hmm. but I still appreciate that you mm -hmm. tried to connect me. Mm -hmm. Those sorts of things. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of it's just being polite. Yeah, 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 um, for sure. But being mindful and, and being proactive and not only reaching out when you have a request. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I think yeah. that's very important. Yeah, good. Well, Kelly, I really do appreciate you coming back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good to see you. Yeah.